Good morning. Happy 4th of July. <laughs> Come on in. This is a day that the Lord has made. We're rejoicing in it. We're rejoicing in this time for the 4th of July. Our country became a country over 200 years ago. Israel was a country for, I don't know, 4,000 years ago. <laughs> So we're kind of new kids on the block. But I'd like to read to you from Psalms. So if you would please stand, we'll read from the Word. We're reading through Psalm 119. It's an acrostic. And we'll be reading the third letter, Gamel, today. Deal bountifully with your servant that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight, and they are my counselors. This is the word of God. Amen. Can we say those things of ourselves, that we will meditate, that we will keep his law? In Christ we do. He has promised that he will bring us more and more into conformity into his son's image. And so we are thankful for that. And we praise him for that. So please stand and sing. Sing, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to Oh, 
those who are Christians, we know the word independence is very, very limited. We do not at all experience independence. It is a joke, really. We are dependent upon God, utterly, utterly dependent upon God for our very existence, let alone our new life. We are dependent upon Christ. And may we, especially today, not forget that, especially as we worship together. fortress is our God. A mighty fortress is our God. A bulwark never
and kindred go. The good and kindred go. This mortal life also. The body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Amen. Those he 
he saves our his delight. Christ will hold me fast, precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast. He'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall Good morning. Welcome to our church today on this special day of Independence Day, July 4th, a day of celebration, a day of fun, I'm sure a day later maybe of some barbecues and some fireworks. But what a blessing it is to be gathered together to worship God with the, the saints here at Redeemed South Bay. Uh, I just have to say, your voices are beautiful. And to hear your voices lifted up to praise and, and honor our Christ and our Lord is a blessing to me personally, and, and I hope to each of you as you hear your voices raised. Today, if you're here for the first time, we want to welcome you. And we know that because God is sovereign over all things, that uh, He has purposed and sent you here today to be here to hear His Word proclaimed. And uh, as we welcome you, we want to tell you a couple of things. One is that, is that we truly love you. We count you as a gift of God, and we do love you. Christ has commanded us to love you and to, uh, to welcome you, and so we, we do today. And one of the ways that we love you, one of the most profound ways that we love you, is by loving you enough to tell you the truth. The truth is, first personally, that, that I am a sinner, and so is every person sitting in this congregation today. We are all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And so the best thing we can do for you is to tell you the truth in love, that you are a sinner and that you may be saved today, for today is the day of salvation. And so our prayer for you today is that God will move on your heart and that you will cry out to him for salvation. Now we come to a, a place in our time when we share communion together. We have what we refer to as a pastoral prayer. And um, after I pray, the communion elements will be passed. If you're a born-again believer and a baptized believer in Jesus Christ, then you're welcome to, we welcome you to join in communion with us. 
If not, then we pray that, that today would be your day of salvation and that in the future you may join us in this communion service. The place will be passed. Um, there's a double cup. If you'll take those cups, the crackers on the bottom, the juices on the top, take those, hold on to those, and I'll come back in a moment and lead us in communion. But now let's pray together, and uh, our prayer today is going to be led by Psalm 111. Let's pray now. Praise the Lord. Lord, we do praise you. We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks to you with our whole hearts here in the company of the upright, here in this congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Lord, you are great, you are marvelous, and everything you have accomplished is awesome and beautiful to behold. Lord, full of ma splendor and majesty are all your works, and your righteousness endures forever. We look around us, Lord, and we see in general revelation all those things that are created, and they point to you, a divine, creative God who is amazing and wonderful. Lord, we can look at the things that you have created from the stars and the heavens, the moons, the, the planets all in orbit, Lord, to the, to the creation of the baby in the womb. All of these things, incredible and beautiful, and they cry out that there is a God. Lord, you provide food for those who fear you. You are our great provider, and we give thanks to you for providing us with the basic needs that we have, those of food and clothing and shelter. Lord, how can we not remember the provision for this nation? Lord, you have sovereignly called a people to yourself here. You have created this nation, and we thank you for that. We know that, Lord, not everyone in this nation honors and fears you. So we pray, Lord, by your sovereign will, that you will, in your kindness, call every citizen of America to honor and serve you, that they would repent, that they would turn from their sin, and they would honor you, Jesus, as Lord over all. Father, we pray that this really would be one nation under God. Lord, that is our only hope. You are our only hope. But we, Lord, we, we, we thank you again and again for the freedoms that we experience, the ability to, to gather here today to worship you unhindered at this point in history. We know that in many lands across the world, in many countries, Lord, that you love as well, people are not free to worship you as they ought. And so we pray for those who are in other lands uh, where, where they are being oppressed. We ask for your grace and mercy for those people even now. Lord, your works are faithful and just. All your precepts are trustworthy. Lord, you have established them forever and, and forever, and, and they will be performed with faithfulness and righteousness. Lord, you will never forget your word. Lord, your covenants are everlasting. You will never forget your people. And so we thank you. Even as we sung today, Lord, you cling to us. We cling to you. Why do we cling to you, O oh God? Because you cling to us. We've begged you today to hold us fast, and we know that you will do that very thing. So we thank you for clinging to us. We thank you for holding us. We thank you for protecting us from the evil one. Lord, we thank you that, that as, even as we sang in a mighty fortress, Lord, your word your word, the living word of Christ, has defeated our enemy, Satan, and that we have independence. We have freedom in Christ today. Lord, we remember that your name is holy and awesome. And we also remember, O oh God, that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Lord, help us, Father, to fear you as we ought. Help us to be husbands who fear you before our wives. Help us to be uh, fathers who fear you before our children, help us to show the fear of the Lord in our households, that we respect and fear you, for that is where wisdom begins. Everything else, Lord God, is folly. We know that. Lord, we ask now that you would be with our congregation. Lord, we thank you for protecting us through this uh, year or so that we've been meeting. We know that, that, that there have been points at which uh, uh, some have, have come against us and, and, and wanted us to shut down our, our meetings, but, but Lord, you have hold, helped us to stand fast and to continue meeting. We thank you for that. And we pray, Lord, that you would provide for us a larger facility. We need more space, and, and you see that and you know that. 
Lord, we entrust this endeavor into your hands, but we ask that you would do that for us, Lord, that we may continue to grow uh, both spiritually and in numbers as well. Father, we pray for all those in our congregation who need your healing touch. Lord, we know that you are a great healer and that nothing is too hard for you. Lord, so even now, for those who need your touch, we ask that you would heal them and strengthen them. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this communion we're about to partake. Lord, as we reflect on the the, the body and the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, may may we remember him, may we proclaim his death until you come again. And we uh, commit our time to you even now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may have heard this saying before. Freedom is not free. Freedom is not free. Freedom is costly. And the freedom we celebrate today as a nation, we remember and we're thankful for those who have given their lives for us that we may assemble. We may worship God as we choose. Because freedom is is not free. But we need to be reminded also As believers in Christ, that we did not, of our own accord, simply decide to be free and throw off our chains, throw off our fetters, cause dead men to come to life. No. We were dead, Ephesians 2 tells us, in our sins and trespasses. We were captive to a demonic power. We were sons of darkness, not of light. We were slaves. We were not free. And in that situation, someone had to come and free us. Someone had to help us. Someone had to rescue us. And that person is Jesus Christ. Galatians 5, our brother, the Apostle Paul, reminds us, For freedom, Christ has set us free. Who set us free? Christ. For a reason, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. You're free. Stand in your freedom and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back, he's telling us, And telling the Galatians, don't go back under the old way, the old law, where you're trying to, as we've sung here in our our songs, to, to, to somehow work our way to heaven. Don't go back under this yoke of slavery, but instead live as free men and women. Free what? Just to do whatever we want? No. Free to follow Christ. Our freedom is not to do whatever we want. But as a Christian, in some level it is, because we are free now to do what we want. And what do we want to do? We want to serve Christ. So Jesus has changed our wants. God has changed our desires that we want to, in our freedom, use it to serve Christ. Freedom is Christ. Freedom, uh, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand, therefore, and do not submit to a yoke again of slavery. So as we have communion today, let us remember what Christ has done for us to set us free. He has endured the cross. He has taken on the wrath of his Father, all for us, so that we may be free. The Apostle Paul, again, in 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen 18, says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take the bread, remembering our Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul continues, 
In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We drink this until he comes. Father, we thank you again for your blessed Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that, that, is, that causes us to, to understand, to, to see the Word of God and to understand the gospel, to, to regenerate us by the power of the Spirit so we may believe that Jesus is who he says he is, the Christ, the Son of the living God. So we thank you, Father, both for your Son and for your blessed Spirit. We thank you for your fatherhood over us, for adopting us as children into your family. And Lord, now we pray that uh, even this day as we celebrate this nation, we will celebrate also our freedom in Christ. And may we live out that freedom and no longer turn back to the slavery of sin, to the slavery of Satan. We commit ourselves to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, right now we're going to take a, a, little, a little break here. If you have children who are fifth grade and down, we have uh, classes prepared for them. Uh, your children are always welcome to stay with us in the assembly if they'd like to do that or if you would like them to do that. And so we may break now. Go to, children, go to class. And um, everyone else, let's reassemble here pretty quickly. Check, check. Good morning, church. Go ahead and make your way to your seats. We'll continue our time together with a few announcements. For those of you parents with the kids in the classes, we're continuing to try to expedite the process. So you probably noticed that we have the names filled out now on the check-in sheets. So you guys can just uh, put your phone number and, and initial on there. Uh, one other thing that's important that you can take advantage of that would speed up that process too is if half or more of you on the way in uh, can sign your, your student in, or fill out the sheet, but take your student into the, the service with you, uh, then when it comes time to drop them off, uh, that's already filled out for you. So we want to encourage you to do that, to continue to uh, speed up that process for us as we check students into the classrooms. Um, also, we want to announce that tomorrow night, our youth and young adults group, our loft group, will not be meeting, uh, but our, our women's Bible study will continue to meet um, tomorrow night here. Um, we have a, a bunch of needs. If you look down in your bulletin for, for volunteers, uh, we could use your help bringing food, serving food, um, moving the, the beverage setup that's in the front and to the back. That doesn't do that on its own. I don't... Somebody actually does that, which is amazing. Thank you, whoever does that. Actually, we have no one to do that today. If anyone wants to pick that up and, and, and do that, that would be wonderful. Uh, and then fellowship area tear down, uh, you, can, you could also help with that. So uh, look at that list of volunteer needs, and if you're available for any of those and are willing to commit to just once a month handling one of those, that would be a huge blessing to our church. Um, so thank you for that. Also, we want to announce our church history class coming up. Uh, really excited about that. Pastor Kenny uh, will be teaching Sunday afternoons from 2 to 4 p.m., uh, 2,000 years of church history in, packed into 10 weeks. So uh, it's an ambitious goal, and I think that you're going to just really enjoy that time. So uh, that's completely free. Go ahead and uh, join us for that. Please RSVP for that. That would be uh, a help as well, no later than July 7th. And that class will be starting July 11th. Also, our membership class, also taught by Pastor Kenny, will be uh, this July 24th, and that is 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And so if you're uh, wondering what it means to be a member of a local church, if you're wondering what the Bible has to say about the local church and, and its purpose and, and why we gather and, and what we're to be about, uh, come to that class and, and, and learn. Um, you'll get a free lunch yummy lunch every time and is provided for you and there's no cost for that so uh again please rsvp to penny ross by july 31st for for that a couple more announcements we want you to know uh we want to continue to announce the um reality apologetics conference that we're going to take some of our, our students and young adults to uh so if you haven't gotten a ticket for that it's just a reminder to you to um get a ticket for that um also 
want to announce our beach volleyball, on, which is on Thursdays at, at 5 p.m. At, at Knob Hill. And you don't have to be, you know, six feet tall, and you don't have to be good at volleyball uh, to come out and to play. And you don't, even if you don't want to play volleyball, you can just come and hang out on the beach. A lot of people are just enjoying that time of, of fellowship together. So uh, we are taking a break through our, our series through the Gospel of John. And we're beginning our Summer of Psalm series. And so we're excited about that. The Psalms are a huge just blessing to, to look at and to read and to meditate on. Uh, and so they're, they're also a perfect time for you guys to invite uh, people to, to, to the church this, this summer and uh, let them hear the Psalms and let them uh, learn about God and his, his grace and his goodness. And uh, so I wanted to, I was thinking about this, I wanted to throw out a challenge to you guys, just one person. Just invite, each of you, just invite one person a week uh, to church this summer and see what the Lord does. Invite them to come and to hear about God's greatness proclaimed in, this, in the book of Psalms. I think that's all I have here. Oh, we could also use food servers today if anyone's willing to, after service, jump into the line to help serve, uh, or behind the tables to help serve food. That would be uh, a huge, a huge blessing. So, uh, with that said, we want to remind you that uh, our church has a plurality of elders who rotate the, the preaching. And so this morning, uh, we'll be hearing from Pastor Jeff Lewis. Each week, you hear from a different pastor. Uh, we usually pick, pick a portion of scripture and work through it verse by verse. And, and so the point of our sermons is the point of the text. We're not up here on a hobby horse or anything. We're trying to come under the authority of God's word, understand it, and preach it. And so that's what we have the joy of, of hearing this morning. So before we do that, could you please stand and we'll sing one more song of praise as we ask God to prepare our hearts to hear and receive the preaching of his word. Amen. We look forward to, to leading you in, in worship music in the summer of the Psalms. It's a, it's a blessing. And as we have done traditionally, we sometimes introduce a song uh, just for the week that we're doing a uh, a psalm and it matches the the psalm and so this is a, a a hymn called set me in your way O lord and it's based on the psalm that will be preached today um, and since we only have uh, this one time as a congregation to share this song um, let me help you to s understand the melody and we'll go over the third verse right now Gracious, kind, compassionate, 
face to me your compassion towards me show give me strength and save my life on your servant grace bestow grant a sign of favor lord which my Well, good morning, church. As Jeff mentioned, we are taking a break from our study in the book of John and going through our summer of Psalms. And to date, over the last several years, we have preached 28 out of 150 Psalms. So we have 122 to go. <laughs> After today, we will have 121. No, it's a, I think it's a great study. And uh, so we'll be looking at Psalm 86, if you would turn there. If you're new with us or you're using one of the Pew Bibles, it's on page 494. And just to give you a little background, this is a Psalm of David. And if you don't know this, the, the book of Psalms is actually broken down in, into five different books. There's five different books, and this is actually in the third book. And this is the only Psalm of David in the third book. And I think it's interesting because... Uh, we know that David wrote so many of the Psalms, and, and what we see in this Psalm, and in Psalm 86, we see that it is a, a prayer of David, and it's David's uh, heart being poured out to a God that, that he knows and that he loves, and he knows that this God loves him. And, and so I want to take a little bit of a different tack today. I want to obviously preach through it, but I want us to learn. I want us to learn to pray. I want us uh, to use this psalm that, that is a prayer of David so that we might know how to pray better. And so if you would read with me Psalm 86, uh, verses 1 through 17. This is the word of God. A prayer of David. Incline your ear, O Lord, and answer me. For I am poor and needy. Preserve my life, for I am godly, Savior, servant, who trusts in you, you are my God. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. Gladden the soul of your servant, for to you, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Listen to my plea for grace. In the day of my trouble, I call upon you, for you answer me. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give, you th I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God with my whole heart, and I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. O God, insolent men have risen up against me. A band of ruthless men seeks my life, and they do not set you before them. But you, O Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Turn to me and be gracious to me. Give your strength to your servant and save the son of your maidservant. Show me a sign of your favor that those who hate me may see and be put to shame because you, Lord, have helped me and comforted me. Let's pray. Father, we come before you and, Lord, we hear the words of David in this psalm and we recognize that he is a, a man who is in a difficult situation. And 
Lord, while this psalm is, is not the most poetic of psalms, it is a, a psalm that has your name written on it. What is it? It is a prayer of David to you. And God, I pray that as we look at this psalm, Lord, that we would learn to love you and honor you and pray to you, and that we would pray in a way that brings you glory and honor, or that our prayers would be driven to a, a God who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness. For that's what this psalm tells us who you are. Lord, we thank you again for your word. We pray that you would write it on our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, but have you ever noticed that praying can be difficult? Anybody here know that, that praying can be, be difficult? There are, are distractions. There's a, a lack of consistency that we have. Sadly, there's apathy and there's lethargy. We don't know what to pray and we don't know how to pray. And you know, we're often looking for something to, to help us to pray. And, and I think one of the ways we can do that is by looking at, at the Psalms. And one of the ways that, that has helped me, and, I, and I've used this uh, often in my life, is, is an acronym. It's the word ACTS, A-C-T-S. And I've used that. It, 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 it speaks of adoration and, and confession and thanksgiving and, and supplication because prayer is not just about asking God for things. Prayer is, is, is glorifying Him. It's, it's speaking to Him. It's acknowledging who He is because when we acknowledge who God is, what He does is it strengthens us to, to, to reach Him and, and to, to plead with Him according to His purposes and, and His goodness and His, His glory. And one of the things that's often helpful to me is, is, is praying through, through the Psalms and learning. And, and there's a book that that I've looked at before, and it's the, the Psalms, a, a primer for prayer. And it's, it's a book that just simply has all the song, Psalms listed, and then it, it shows how you might pray these Psalms. And, and we might think that when, when we borrow from the Psalms to pray, or, or we borrow from Scripture to pray, that it's somewhat inauthentic. Oh, I don't want to pray that. That's not, that's not authentic, or it's, it's unoriginal, borrowing from someone else's prayer. And but one of the interesting things about Psalm 86 is that David, David is borrowing. He's borrowing from Scripture all over the place, and he's play, taking all these Scriptures, and he's placing them in Psalm 86 to help us understand who God is and to help him understand who God is and to approach him. And so Psalm 86, in a sense, is, is not really a, a, an original psalm in and of itself. It's, it's, it's borrowed from these different things. It's, one pastor said it's, it's like a, a mosaic, pieced together verses and phrases from other psalms and scriptures. And I want to say this, that, that we don't necessarily need originality in our prayers. Sometimes originality is lacking. <laughs> We can learn from each other. We can, we can learn from the Psalms and because they are prayers and they're, they're put in the Word of God. And so we can, we can look at these. And, but originality from the heart is important. When we, when we take a Psalm and, and we, we, we incorporate it into our own life and we, we see God for who He is. And one, one of the most amazing things that, that has happened throughout my life is that when I'm going through something difficult and I, and I read a psalm and, and I connect that psalm with what I'm going through, God does an amazing work. I remember years ago, this is probably some 27, 28 years ago, I was in a really difficult place and, and I knew that I, I might lose my job. And I was, I was there and I was in my office and and I had my Bible there, and I, I started to read Psalms. And, and, you know, at that time, I didn't I'll go, I'm going to read this Psalm. No, I just, I read Psalm 25. And, and to this day, Psalm 25 has a dear place in my heart. And it says this, it says, Unto you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Now, in that place where I was, was a dark place, and it was a hard place. And and I knew that I, I needed God, and, and he gave me that psalm for that time. And, and I read it, and as I read it, you know, tears were just running down my face because I was, were taking those words of the psalmist. Unto you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. That's what I was doing. 
unto, unto you, O, Lord, o God, in you I, I trust. And, and they were real. And, the, and so God used us. And I remember calling my, my wife on the phone and, and, and talking to her about this. And, you know, I, I read the whole psalm. I'd like to read the whole psalm, but we're doing Psalm 86. I actually did it a couple of years ago, Psalm 25. But no, it, the, the Word of God does that. It, it encourages us. The, the Bible says that the Spirit helps in our weakness. We have, he's given us the Word of God, and as we appropriate His Word, we're accompanied by a, a, a sincere heart. Hebrews 10.22 says that we can draw near to God and find mercy and grace, and grace in our time of need. And just as David prayed and learned and borrowed from these other psalms and other scriptures, we can do the same as we look at Psalm 86. We can, we can learn something about prayer. And first, our first point in your notes is our prayer should reflect our great need. Sadly, we don't think that we have great needs, do we? How many have realized that when you have great need, you pray? <laughs> don't you? But when we lack prayer, what's it saying? That we, we don't have... We don't have a great need. We see this so clear in, in David, in David's Psalm, of, Psalm 86 and verse 1. He says this, he says, incline your ear, O Lord. What he's saying, hear me. God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you something. Hear me and answer me. Why? Because I am poor and needy. Now, David is basically coming with arguments to God. God, these are the things I'm going to. Therefore, please listen to me. And we can come to God in that way. And so we can say, God, these are real things in my life. And God, I'm going through this. And I'm going and, and to come before you as a, as a poor and needy person. In, in verse 7, he says, in the day of trouble, I call upon the Lord. Paul, uh, David recognizes his weakness. In verse 14, he says, insolent men have, have, have risen up against me. And we see throughout this, this psalm that he's, he's calling out to God for his grace. You know, it sounds obvious to say that, that we have great needs, and these needs should drive us to prayer. But as I said, we don't, we don't really pray as we ought because uh, our pride blinds us from the truth about our needs. We think that we have it all together. We, we think that you know, things are just going so easy. And what we do is we rely on ourselves and we rely on other people and we rely on other methods and we get into trouble and we start trying to figure out all these things. And finally, when nothing else has worked, then we finally call out to God as a last resort. John Bunyan said this, you can do more than pray after you have prayed. You can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you cannot do more than pray until you have prayed. Now, John Bunyan knew that prayer should be our, our first resort, and we don't realize that, that we are poor and needy every day and in every circumstance. Remember what Jesus says? He says, Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. One thing that we do is we neglect God's word. We don't realize that it's important for every day. But Jesus also says that he is the vine and we are the branches, and apart from, from him, we can do nothing. He says, abide in me. We can do nothing apart from him. And so we need to be abiding in Christ. We need to take our lives. You know, we often wonder why why the world is not being transformed, because I think the biggest reason is we're not abiding. It's not about us performing things and doing things. Yes, I think that's an outcome of us abiding, but we lack strength, and we lack purpose, and we lack joy in serving God because we're, we're not abiding in Christ. So we have this blindness, and you know, day after day, we're praying very, very little and because of our blindness and because of our lack of prayer, we don't see God moving. You know, we see Him moving very, very little. It doesn't mean that He's not moving, but we're not connecting our prayers to what He's doing. You know, this blindness is also a reason that unbelievers 
that unbelievers don't cry out to God for, and ask Him to forgive their sins. No, they're blinded to the, the truth of their sins, and they see themselves as, as basically good. You know, when I witness to people and share the gospel at, at work, this is inevitably the, the thing that they say, right? I'm, I'm a good person, and, and God is gracious. I'm a good person, and God is gracious. I, you know, I'm not one of those evil sinners. And what they do is they compare themselves to, to, to other human beings rather than to the holy God. They, they, they compare themselves to who? Hitler. <laughs> I'm not as bad as he is. Or I'm not as bad as this mass murderer. I'm, I'm basically a good person. No, they don't, they don't recognize their, their great need. But another thing that we as, as Christians often fail to see is that, that we are in a spiritual battle. And we, we read, I mean, we sang earlier, a mighty fortress is our God. Martin Luther wrote that. It's an old hymn. But its truths are, are so important for us that we don't realize that we have an enemy. You know, Ephesians 5 says that we, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and heavenly places. You know, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, that our enemy prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to, someone to devour. We know that Galatians talks about our, our indwelling sin that, that fights against us. And we don't really take it seriously. We don't realize that the, the war that is being waged either from inside our hearts or outside from the enemy is a real war, and that we need God's strength to fight that battle. And we need His strength to fight that battle. And we find that strength to fight that battle as we pray. And so we're blind and we don't pray. And so perhaps I think our prayer should be what? Show us. God, show me where I fall short. Show me how to pray. Teach me your ways. I mean, the psalmist says in Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there is any grievous way in me. But he doesn't stop there. He says, and lead me in the way everlasting. No, let me, let me seek you. And God, you show me. You, you put the magnifying glass on, on me. Often what we're doing is we're putting the magnifying glass on somebody else, aren't we? Where they fall short. Look at that person. Look at that Christian. Look what that person's doing. Look what they're doing. No, God, you show me any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And so I knew that when I was reading in my office, Psalm 25, and the chances of my job hung, or losing my job hung over my head, I knew that there was no place to turn. I was, I was poor, and I was needy, and I called out to him, and he answered. You know, our prayer should be, God, I'm in great need. I'm in great need every day, no matter what we're going through. Secondly, though, our, our prayer should, be a ref, uh, should reflect God's unchanging character. You know, like I said, we often get to the things of asking God for things. But one of the, the greatest things in, is we're learning to pray. And as we're praying, that's helpful to us is to remind ourselves of who God is. Because when we understand who God is, we understand that He is the only true God that can answer prayer. You know, this psalm shows that David knew the God of whom he was praying. He, he knew his attributes. He knew his, his character. He knew that he was merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in loving kindness and truth. And in this prayer, David basically sets God, God and his character against all of his enemies. God, you are this and they are this, and I can trust you. One of the things that you don't really say, you don't really see in this, in this psalm is that there's a chiastic structure to the psalm. And if you don't know what that is, it's, it's basically the, a, a literary device that, that the psalm flows from one thought to the next thought to the next thought to the next thought, focusing on this main thought. 
And then it flows backwards through those same previous thoughts to the end. I mean, you see that in verse 2, he says what? That, that he is a servant. And we also see that at the end, working, working back from the end in verse 16. We see in, in verse 5 that, that he's abounding in, in steadfast love. We also see that working back in, in verse 15. And you see in verse 7, you see that he is faced with trouble. And we see that same thing in verse 14 when his enemies have gathered around me. So the, you have this, this structure. But the center point of that, that, this psalm is really 8 through 11. This is, what, this is what David wants us to focus on. And we see this, that he is only true God and there's, there's none like him. Verse 8 says... There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name, for you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. I mean, that's the, the focal point of the psalm. David wants our, our prayers to, to be focused on God because he is the one that can answer our prayers. And he does things and he shows himself in the psalm that he's wonderful and that he answers prayer and that eventually he's going to cause the nations to come and worship before him. That's a, a huge thing that David is hoping on. But that hope that David has is based on the promise that, that God has made that, that all, through Abraham all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And I want you to notice in Psalm 86 that there are a number of, of words used to address God. One is the word just God, and that's the word in Hebrew, Elohim, and we've heard that. But there's also two words for Lord, and if you're looking in your Bibles, you'll see uh, there's a, a, one word with, with, which is all capitals, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, and that's, that's the, the name Yahweh. And it's the, the personal and the, and the covenant name of God, and you see this in, in verses 1 and, and verse 6 and verse 11 and verse 17. But there's another word for Lord, and then you'll see it, it's capital L, lowercase o-r-d. And in Hebrew, that's, that's the word Adonai. It's the, a word that emphasizes his lordship and, and his sovereignty. And we see this seven times throughout the psalm, and he made the nations. He has orda ordained that they will come and, and worship before him. He's great and does wondrous deeds. He is, he is Lord and He is sovereign. And when we, when we think about Him as being the sovereign and we're going through trials, which either we are going through right now or we will go through at some time, we can reach out to Him as the sovereign Lord who is over all these things and we can, we can trust Him. You know, and what David is doing, he, he's contrasting the Lord of all, all the gods of all the other nations. And he says in verse 8, there is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. And we know that there's no other gods, but we know in Scripture that there's idols and there's false gods and there's demons that, that are behind idols. And David is saying, there's none like you. There's none like you, Lord. And notice that He's not just the Lord of Israel. He says, all the nations you have made shall come and worship before you. I, I, just think about David, though. It, it took a, probably a, a lot of faith for David to say that. You know, David is a, a king of this little, tiny nation. And he's saying, all the nations, all the nations of the world are, shall come and they shall worship before you. And David knew. David knew the promises, and that's one of the things that we have to pray is we have to pray the, the promises of God. God had, had promised to Abraham that all the families of the earth would be blessed in him. And David stands on that promise. And that's what we need to do. We need to stand on, on those promises. You know, God's gracious plan to redeem people for himself from, from every tongue and tribe and nation. And David's prayer reflects God's unchanging character and trusting his promises. He says, God, you, you know, you're powerful, you were sovereign. And, that, and that does, what that does is it encourages us to pray. God, I know 
In the midst of this, whatever I'm going through, I can pray because I know you're sovereign and you've allowed this to happen in my life. And you're doing it ultimately for my good and ultimately for your glory. And I can trust you. And our prayer should reflect, reflect this. Our prayer should reflect the power of God to act on our behalf and because we serve an omni- omnipotent, sovereign God who loves his people. And we see this as he calls people, and we think about this, that we are an answer to this prayer right here. We are an answer that God is, is calling people from every tongue and tribe and nation. And doesn't that give us hope that he's going to continue to do that? No, and then we see he's the only true God. He's not just the only true God, and there's none like him. He's the only true God abounding in steadfast love to all that call upon him. And these really are, are tied together, aren't they? That, that he is saving people by them calling on him. Now, both, for, both uh, verse 5 and, and verse 15, David is quoting Exodus chapter 34, verse 6 and 7, where God had revealed himself to Moses. And here's what he says in in Exodus 34, he says, the Lord, the Lord, or, or Yahweh, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will not by no means clear the guilty. See, notice this is, this is what God says about himself. This is what God says. This is not what we say about God. This is what God is, is declaring about himself. You know, people will say God is gracious. But God says, I am merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And this is, this is the most quoted passage in the rest of the Bible. Why is that? Because Declaring God's goodness and graciousness as He declares it is, is so important. And we see it in, in Numbers 14 or Nehemiah chapter 9 or Psalm 103 or Psalm 145 or Psalm 86 or Joel chapter 2 or Jonah chapter 4. And, and we think of this as, as like I said, the, this is the pinnacle of, of this psalm. But I like what one pastor, Sam Al, Alberry, said. He said, This is the banner hanging over everything else God shows us about himself. We see it reiterated time and time again throughout the the Old Testament. Many things are true about God. All of them are glorious. Yet not all of them are fundamental, but this is. This is fundamental. For you, O Lord, are are good and, and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. And notice that in verse 5, that there's a condition, isn't there? And it's that, to all who call upon you. You know, so many people will say, you know, oh, I believe God is gracious. Is God gracious? Yes. He's gracious to all who call upon Him. And people will say, you know, oh yeah, God is gracious, but I'm not going to call on Him. And I, I... you get this picture and of somebody out in the middle of the ocean and they're, and they're treading water and, you know, they see somebody coming to save them and they say, I believe that this person is gracious and they're going to save me. And they reach out their hands and say, well, I believe you're gracious, but I'm not going to reach my hand back. I'm not going to accept the way you're gracious. I want you to accept what I believe about graciousness, which is idolatry. It's, it's making God in, in our own image. No, God has declared that He is gracious to all who call upon Him. And we know that the Apostle Paul, he, he expands on this very thing in, in Romans chapter 10. He says, in Romans chapter 10, 10 verse 9 through 13, he says, if you confess... If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. God's goodness and, and, and forgiveness and abounding steadfast love will be on you. That's, that's what he means. You will be saved. He goes on, he says, For with the heart one believes and is justified, 
And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For, script, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I mean, that is a, an amazing truth that God saves sinners like you and me. But it also means that there's something that we, we, we do. God, God causes us to be born again to a living hope, and, and we, we accept Him, and we put our faith and trust in Him, and we call on His name. So if you're not a Christian, if you're not a Christian, call on His name. His grace, is, He's a compassionate, wonderful God who's ready to forgive. But there's also a, a, a continued blessing if if you are a Christian, because how many of us have failed this week? <laughs> and he's gracious and compassionate. <laughs> Isn't that great news? He's gracious and compassionate. You know, and he invites us to come for forgiveness, mercy, and grace. Notice what David says in, in verse 2. He, he calls out to God, preserve my life. Preserve my life. And then he says this, for I am godly. I think sometimes we look at that and we go, I could never say I'm godly. I could never say I'm holy. How many of us who have put our faith and trust in Christ are godly? How many of us are holy? All of us who have put our faith and trust in Christ. In one sense, right? We know that we need to pursue holiness these words, this godly, this holy, they, they mean that we're set apart. This word godly comes from the Hebrew word hesed, which is where we get the word loving kindness and, or God's covenantal love. This is, this is a covenant between God and us. And so God has, has saved us and he's, he's set us apart for his glory. So what David is saying is, you know, God, I, I come before you in this, in this relationship I have, and, and I know that I, because of what you've done, that you have redeemed me, that I, that I hunger and I, I thirst for righteousness. It doesn't mean that we're perfect, does it? But we do, we hunger, and we sang that earlier, we, we hunger and we thirst for righteousness. Now, David's not being self-righteous, but he's, he's simply stating a fact that he is committed to the Lord. We can say that, I'm committed. And we should pray that, God, I am committed to you. You know, it's his steadfast love that, that David recites in, the, in his prayer, and it's about the Lord's character. And what that does is it motivates us to come and to bring him all of our needs, whether they're great or small. And maybe you feel like, you know, God doesn't have time for me. God has all the time. Time is nothing to God. No. If you sin, he's ready to forgive and if you feel that you don't deserve it, guess what? You don't. <laughs> That's what grace is. It's His grace and it's His mercy. And so we come, we come undeserving, and He is abundant in, in loving kindness to all who call upon Him. And our, so our prayer is, God, I stand, and I stand on, our, on Your character and Your promises, for You are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon You. So our prayer should reflect our great need. Our, our prayer should reflect God's unchanging character. But thirdly, our prayer should reflect our, our complete dependence on Him. And we're going to move through these pretty quickly. But David has a, a, a close relationship with God that, that really permeates his entire life. But, but this prayer, and, and God knew him intimately. And, but David knew, and he knew God in such a way that he, he felt free to pour out his heart. And this, this really stems from an awareness of his great need. And he knows, David knows that if he doesn't, if God doesn't answer this, that he's without hope. He knows he needs God's help. You know, he's coming to God with uh, complete dependence. And David wasn't just mumbling through some formal liturgy that was there, I'm reciting these prayers. Yes, he, he, had, he had chosen these things from other parts of Scripture, but they were true to him and, and true Truly things that were on his heart. 
It wasn't just using a list, and I'm not saying we shouldn't use lists. Lists are good for us to, to memorize, but, but our, our heart needs to be focused on God. And, you know, it, I, it reminded me of a people who you see that are asking for money on a street corner. There are those who you see, and, and they, they clearly have some maybe mental problem or or some physical problem, or and 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 what you, what happens is you, I mean I, I know when I see them I, I there's a compassion that I have I, I I wish I could help I wish I could do something I wish I could change things for them but then there are others there are others who you see them out on the street corner and they're perfectly healthy and able and they're well dressed and. Specifically, I, I think about a, somebody who lives in a neighborhood near me that I see him come out of his nice house and I see him walk to the corner and I see him stand on the corner and I, and I see him asking for money and, and I, I'm suspect. But David is like the first one, isn't he? David is like the one who, who knows that his, he has a really poor condition. He knows that he's weak and frail. And he comes before the Lord asking, he says, I, I need you. And he knows that he has a, a complete dependence on him, and that leads him to pray. And it leads us to pray that we should pray continually. That we should pray continually. David says in verse 3, he says, For unto you I, I cry all day long. For unto you I cry all day long. It's Again, his continual prayers are driven by his great need. And Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 17, that we should pray without ceasing. And he doesn't mean that we should necessarily pray nonstop, which, you know, in some ways is impossible, but rather the word has this idea of keep coming back to prayer over and over again throughout the day. We should be praying continually. Secondly, we should... We should pray thankfully. We see this in verse 12. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. That's because David has a complete dependence on God, and he knows that, that no matter what he's going through, this trial that he's going through, he can give thanks because he knows God's purposes are good and pleasing and perfect, and he can trust Him. And similarly, right after praying... After Paul telling us to pray without ceasing, he, he says, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And we can only give thanks if we, if we truly believe that, that God is sovereign, that He's loving and compassionate, that He's wise, and that He knows what He's doing. You know, we can be thankful because we know God knows what He's doing. So we pray continually. We pray, we pray thankfully. We should also pray with humility David's prayer is filled with humility. He doesn't demand from God. He doesn't say, God, you, I deserve this. God, don't you know that I am one of your children? God, don't you know that I'm the king and I deserve these things? No, he doesn't complain. Look, I've, I've served you all these years and, and now this is what I get? No. No, he just comes in, in humility Verse 1 says that he is poor and needy. Verse 2, verse 4, and verse 16, he refers to himself as, as God's servant. Verse 3, he prays for God to be gracious to him. Verse 16, he admits that he is weak by asking God to grant him, to grant him strength. Don't we need that? God, grant me strength. This is so opposite of our, our leaders today. Our leaders today rarely admit that they were wrong. They rarely admit that they need any help whatsoever. And even if they're Christians, they, they may pray when they're by themselves and, and with the Lord. But David bears it all as the king. He bears it all before his people. Look, this is who I am. But what a testimony to his people. Look at our king. Our king can pray this way. I can pray this way. Now, David humbly acknowledges his weakness, and his need for, for God's strength. And even so, prayer is not asking God just to, to give us a, a little boost forward or a little help. 
No, it's acknowledging our, our complete dependence on Him. James chapter 4, verse 6 says that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So we, we come to Him continually, thankfully, and humbly. And lastly, we, in this section, we should, we should pray believing. David believed God. David says in verse 2 that he trusts in God because he's seen God move, and he declares in verse 7 that he knows that, that God will answer him. He says in verse 13 that, that God has delivered his soul from the, the depths of Sheol. And what David's doing is he's, he's referring back to everything that he has seen God do. And so many times when we go through a trial and, and we lose heart or we become anxious, we're not looking back at God's faithfulness. But we need to we need to look back at, at God's faithfulness and we need to remind ourselves that, that we need to pray believing because God is good and He answers. No, so we should pray because we have great needs. We should pray because we have a, a, a great God who, who loves us and, and has compassion on us. And we should pray contem- continually and thankfully in humility and believing that God is, is going to answer those prayers. Which brings us to our last point. The things we ask for, our prayer should reflect God's purposes. It should reflect God's purposes. And what I mean by this is you can't go wrong praying God's perfect will. You can't go wrong praying what God has declared in His Word. Because if He's declared in His Word, this is something that that He wants to do. What is God's will for us? Well, first and foremost, we should pray for salvation. We should pray for salvation. And if you're, if you're not a Christian, then that should be your, your first prayer. You should pray for, for salvation. But if you're a Christian, then you should be praying for the salvation of the lost. David here, he, he asked God to save him, and clearly that's the, the trials that he's going through. But in our context... We know that we need God. We need God to save us. But we also know that he needs, we, need, he, we want him to save others. Jesus says this, and he says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's God's will. And so we should be praying for people to come to know the Lord. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That is God's will, and we should pray that God save this person. Now, he didn't come to save decent people. I think Pastor Kevin said this earlier. We're all sinners. We're all in need of a Savior. Pray that God would open up their hearts to the truth of of the gospel. But another thing is we should pray for joy. You ever notice that often Christians lack joy? David asks in verse 4, maybe even David lacked joy at times. Look what he says in verse 4. He says, gladden the soul of your servant. I think he's, God, give me joy. You know, I'm going through this trial, and I'm, I'm not having it. I'm not having joy, and I'm struggling through this. I don't see your purposes, and I'm lacking confidence, but grant me joy that I can go through this trial. We should pray for joy, and God wants us to be joyful. Paul will say in Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We need to remember that, that God is our satisfaction. We sang earlier, cling to Christ. And this, one, this one line in that song says, all, this treasures of, all the treasures of this world can never satisfy. You alone are endless joy. So I cling to Christ. See, a lot of times when we're lacking joy, we're, we're looking for other things to, to fill that void and, and to satisfy us. But God wants us to be satisfied in Him. Psalm 43 verse 4 says, then I will go to the altar of God. What, what he's saying, I will go to the altar, altar of God. I will pray, I will seek Him. To God, my exceeding joy. God is your joy. John Piper, I had to go to 
John Piper's website when I was writing this, because John Piper is, is the, the, the pastor of joy, and he says this, when we pray, we are pursuing a fuller joy, a deeper pleasure, a more abundant life in God. We want to glorify Him all the more in all we do, so we ask Him to satisfy us all the more with Himself. We pray to see more of His glory, to experience more of His strength and help, to feel more joy in God. Prayer is an especially vital and precious means God has provided to us to pursue our joy in Him. If you're lacking joy, if you're lacking joy, my, my question is, are you spending time with Him? Are you seeking Him on, on, on your terms? Are you okay with the trials that you're going through and, and understanding that you can be thankful in all circumstances and you can come to Him and ask Him to provide that joy that you're lacking? And, that, and believing that God will actually give you that joy even in the mi- most difficult trials you're going through. No, we should, we should pray for joy. We should also pray for a, a teachable heart. You see this in verse 11. He says, teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Now, in any trial, having a heart that is willing to listen to God, having a, a heart that is teachable is, is so important that as we draw near to Him, that we are okay, that that whatever His will, I mean, this is what Jesus prays in the garden, let your will be done. Are we okay with that? And then we ask God for a teachable heart. God, show me what you're actually doing that is for my good and for your glory. Now, most of us pray for a quick deliverance, but it seems that David has been going through this trial for a an awfully long time, and he's, he's saying, God, let me, let me know your heart. Let me know what, what you want for me. Unite my heart to fear your name. You know, he wants to be wholly devoted to God, and he wants to fear his name. And so often trials, people who profess faith, they, they, they do so when things are going really well, things are easy, and then when the trial comes, what they do is they, they get angry now you get angry at God that, why would you allow this to happen to me? God knows. God knows what we need. He knows what is good for us. And He knows what will bring Him the most glory. And we have to trust Him in that. You know, we need to learn and, and trust Him. Teach me, O Lord, verse 11, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God. With my whole heart, I will glorify your name forever. That's David's heart's desire is to glorify your name. That, that, that brings us to our last point. We should pray for God's glory to be made known. And we see that all the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. Verse 12, I give thanks to you, O Lord, my God, with my with my whole heart, I will glorify your name forever. I mean, one of the reasons that, that God brings trials into our lives is so that when we call upon him and when he answers and when he rescues us, we glorify him. And, and I think this is true of my own life. When I look back at the most difficult situations that I've gone through and I see God's faithfulness, it's during those times that that God gets the most glory, those diff- most difficult times. Because I recognize his, without, him that, without Him that I would be nothing. And you know, God says in Psalm 50, verse 15, He says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. You shall glorify me. And all the trials that, that we go through, we should be looking for ways in everything that we go through to glorify the Lord and so that others would be, would be drawn to him. And no matter what trial we're going through or you're going through right now, David says in verse 5 again, For you, O Lord, are good and forgiving, abounding in steadfast love to all who call upon you. The thing that we need to learn is to call upon him. We need to learn to pray. We need to, 
pray and, and glorify his name, that his glory would fill all the earth. And as we, we do so, we, we proclaim the good news of Christ, that the whole earth would be filled with his glory. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, and we thank you for your, your grace to us. Lord, that we can call to you on the, in our day of trouble, and that you will deliver, and you will be glorified through us. God, I pray that our hearts would be drawn to you as we study the Psalms this summer. Lord, that we would recognize our, our weakness, and we would recognize your power. Lord, that you would be glorified, glorified through your servants. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The elders are going to be up front. If you have any prayer need, please come up here. They would love to pray with you. Let's stand and let's sing God's praises one more time. Fuck 
Well, in light of it being 4th of July and Independence Day, I thought that I would, I would pray for our, our country and that I would use Psalm 86 and what we've just learned as, as just a, a kind of a jumping off place. And Father, we come before you. We recognize that this country is in, in great need. That this country has turned its, its back on you and we are following after false gods and false securities. We are, we are looking to man to solve our problems rather than you. So we have a great need. But we come before you in seeking your, your unchanging character. That there is none like you among the nations. That you have promised that you would bring all the nations to come and, and worship before you. Lord, we know that you're, you're doing that, that you're calling people from every tongue and tribe and nation, and that, Lord, your word tells us that the gates of hell will not prevail again against the building of your church. Lord, we know that you are abounding in, in steadfast love to all who call upon you. And so we, pro, we proclaim your love to, to, to this country that they might come and repent and seek you and, and find your grace and your mercy. Lord, our prayer, come, we come to you in complete dependence. I pray for this church that we would pray continually for this nation. I pray that we would pray thankfully, Lord, for our freedoms and, and our liberty to worship you in this nation. Lord, I pray that we would hold fast to the freedom that we have in Christ. We pray in humility. We can't change things in this nation, we must trust you because you are faithful. We, we pray believing that you, as I've already said, Lord, that you would build your church and, and we hold on to that promise. And we pray, Lord, that we would be people about your gospel, that we'd be filled with joy, we'd, we would have teachable hearts. And we pray, Lord, most of all, that your glory would be displayed in each and every one of our lives and in this nation and in this world. We pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you again for this day. In Jesus' name, amen.